You're probably familiar with this footage. A grainy black and white film. A strange contraption lurches down a wooden rail. And then, it lifts. The day the Wright brothers made history. In school, we were taught that this was the first human flight. The two bicycle mechanics from Ohio solved the greatest challenge of the modern age. But that isn't true. They weren't the first. Not by a long shot. Long before the Wright brothers lifted off, humans had already been in the air. Not dreaming, not testing, but flying. And somehow, we forgot. This is the story of skybound dreams, the myths, the machines, and the men who got there first, but never made it into the textbooks. Because human flight isn't just a single moment, it's a history that keeps slipping through our fingers. This is the lost history of human flight. Centuries before the Wright brothers, before da Vinci, before steam or steel or engines, there was a man on a hill in Cordoba, Spain. The year was 875. His name was Abbas Ibn Firnas. He wasn't a legend. He was a scientist, a polymath in a golden age of knowledge. When Islamic scholars were charting the stars, solving equations, and building machines that wouldn't reach Europe for another 500 years, Ibn Firnas was building wings. He studied birds. He observed wind currents. And then, according to multiple historical accounts, he launched himself from a height and glided. He didn't crash. He didn't die. In fact, one account says he stayed aloft for a considerable distance. But when he landed, his back was injured. Not because his wings failed, but because he forgot the tail. He had done the impossible and lived to analyze his mistake. But history didn't treat it that way. The West would forget his name. His flight would vanish into the margins of obscure Islamic texts. And for the next 500 years, humanity would keep trying to relearn what he may have already known. Because the dream of flight never died, it just kept crashing. After Abbas Ibn Firnas launched himself into the air, the world went quiet. No new wings, no recorded flights. But the dream didn't die, it waited. And nearly 600 years later, it found a new host. A man who saw birds not as symbols of freedom, but as machines. Leonardo da Vinci wasn't just a painter. He was an engineer of the impossible. While others painted angels in the sky, Leonardo tried to build them. He dissected birds, measured air currents, designed machines with flapping wings, gliding surfaces, and spiraling rotors. All based on nature, all grounded in math. And if he had access to lighter materials, some of them might have worked. He never flew, at least not in the way we define it today. But what he built was more than art. It was data. It was a bridge reaching forward to a future that didn't yet exist. And he wasn't alone. As the Renaissance bloomed, so did the obsession with human flight. Across Europe, men were jumping from towers with homemade wings often to their deaths. They were tailors, priests, soldiers. Some were celebrated, most were laughed at, but they all shared one belief, that the air belonged to us. And when they fell, they fell hard, not from just towers, but from history. Because these were the failures that never made it into your textbooks, the prototypes that came too early, the visionaries who didn't survive long enough to be remembered. But they were chasing something real, because just beyond the horizon, flight was beginning to feel possible. By the 1800s, something had changed. The dream of flight was no longer just spiritual, symbolic, or all-around crazy. It became mechanical. This was the century of engineers, the age of steam, steel, and patent offices. And suddenly, the sky was full of possibilities. The first to truly understand flight wasn't a pilot. He was a baronet, a gentleman scientist in rural England, who in 1853 built a glider that carried a man through the air. His name was George Cayley, and he cracked the four forces of flight, lift, thrust, drag, and weight, decades before anyone else. 
On the day of the test, Kaylee convinced his coachman to ride the glider. His coachman flew and survived, then promptly quit. His words, Sir George, I was hired to drive, not to fly. Kaylee didn't claim he had invented flight, but he did lay the blueprint for everything that came next. And then in Germany, a man decided that blueprint wasn't enough. He didn't want to describe flight, he wanted to live in it. Otto Lilienthal I, the Glider King, made over 2,000 flights between 1891 and 1896. Not leaps, not stunts, but controlled glides. He built curved wings, he wrote aerodynamic equations, and for a few brief seconds at a time, he became a bird. Crowds gathered, princes came to watch. The Wright brothers read his writings obsessively. Then, one summer afternoon, Lilienthal stalled mid-glide. He crashed, broke his spine, and with his last breath, he whispered, sacrifices must be made. Otto Lilienthal died chasing the sky, but his fall didn't end the dream. It passed it on. That same decade, across the Atlantic, a doctor named Solomon Andrews was flying too, but his story didn't end in a crash. It ended in silence. In 1863, he demonstrated an aircraft called the Arion. It didn't use an engine. Instead, it floated like a balloon and steered by shifting its weight and venting gas. A silent, steerable airship. Witnesses saw it fly over Perth Amboy, New Jersey and return home without aid. He offered it to the Union Army during the Civil War. They said no, too experimental, too unreliable. Solomon Andrews faded from the story, but for a brief moment, he had built something real. And then, like so many others, he was forgotten. So many others tried, some succeeded, but still, no one had yet conquered powered flight. Not truly, not with control, and not with proof. The sky was waiting, and history was almost ready to pay attention, because something was about to happen. Not in a lab, not on a glider hill, but in the open sky where everyone could see it. By the mid-1890s, the sky felt close, too close. We'd spent centuries crawling toward it, and suddenly, it was staring back. In the fall of 1896, something strange began happening over California. People across the state, from Sacramento to San Francisco, reported seeing a giant, cigar-shaped craft drifting silently through the night sky. It had lights, wings, propellers, and no explanation. At first, newspapers made a joke of it. Then the reports kept coming. Within weeks, sightings were spreading east to Nebraska, Illinois, Texas. One report described it landing in a field. Another claimed the pilot spoke with witnesses. Some said it used electricity. Others said it vanished. By April 1897, it had become a full-blown airship panic. Hundreds of eyewitness accounts, multiple alleged landings, even cattle mutilations. The military denied involvement. No inventor came forward. And then, just as quickly as it arrived, the airship disappeared. Skeptics say it was mass hysteria, that people imagined what they wanted to see, just ahead of a new century of science fiction and wonder. But others aren't so sure, because the airship wasn't described as alien, it was described as human, a machine, a creation, which raises the real question, who built it? Some believed it was a secret inventor, a genius who cracked powered flight years before the Wright brothers but never went public. We may never know what really happened in 1896, but it left behind a chilling possibility that someone got there first and chose to disappear. Three years before the Wright brothers ever touched sand at Kitty Hawk, a man in Bridgeport, Connecticut may have already beaten them to the sky. His name was Gustav Whitehead, a German immigrant, an inventor, and possibly the first man in history to fly a powered aircraft. According to multiple eyewitnesses, including reporters, Whitehead's aircraft lifted off the ground on August 14, 1901, and flew nearly half a mile at 50 feet before making a controlled landing. He didn't fly once, he flew twice that morning. And days later, he was photographed preparing the same machine for another test flight. But something strange happened next. Whitehead's name vanished. His achievements were forgotten. And when the Wright brothers made their flight in 1903, no one mentioned the German mechanic who might have beaten them to it. Some point to the lack of surviving photographs. Others say he lacked credibility or that the media misreported it. 
But a few researchers believe something darker happened. In 1948, the Smithsonian agreed to display the Wright Flyer on one condition, that it be recognized as the first powered controlled flight in history, a clause that some say effectively buried all competing claims. But in 2013, something unexpected happened. Jane's All the World's Aircraft, the aviation industry's most respected publication, declared that Whitehead was likely the first. It shook the field. But for most people, the story came too late. The history books had already been written. The monument was already built. And Gustav Whitehead, the man who had flown before the world was watching, was already forgotten. On December 17, 1903, the Wright Flyer rose above the dunes of Kitty Hawk for just 12 seconds. It traveled 120 feet. It was short, awkward, uneven, but it changed everything. Because unlike Whitehead, Cayley, or Lilienthal, the Wright brothers had what others didn't. Proof, photographs, eyewitnesses, control, and perhaps most importantly, a patent. They didn't just invent flight, they copyrighted the sky. And when others tried to build flying machines, the Wrights sued. While Europe soared ahead in experimentation, the US aviation industry stalled under lawsuits. For five years, flight innovation in America slowed because only one story was allowed to fly. The Wrights earned their place in history, but the price of their victory was forgetting everyone else. By the early 20th century, flight had become modern. Wires, propellers, engines, machines built by men in sheds and labs. But the idea of flight, that's much older. And maybe so is the reality. Because scattered across ancient ruins, scrolls, and carvings, there are clues, symbols, artifacts that don't quite fit. Not in time, not in place, not in what we're supposed to believe was possible. In the Temple of Seti at Abidus, Egypt, a panel appears to show a helicopter. Beside it, what some interpret as a submarine, a jet, a drone. Mainstream archaeologists say it was layered hieroglyphics, the result of erosion. But for others, it's a remnant. In Colombia, the Kimbaya culture left behind gold figurines shaped like delta-winged aircrafts, complete with stabilizers and tail rudders. When scaled up and fitted with engines, they fly. And in Peru, the Nazca lines stretch across the desert floor, hundreds of enormous geoglyphs visible only from above. Why? How? To who? Some say these were religious offerings. Some say they were maps. But others, quietly, controversially, suggest they were made by people who had already been to the sky or were building toward it. We don't know what these people believed. We only know they carved shapes meant to be seen from above, just like we do today. Maybe flight isn't a modern story. Maybe it's a cycle, something we discover, lose, and rediscover again, like fire, like language, like memory. We're told flight began in 1903, but the truth, it had already happened, again and again. Men flew gliders, they built airships, some even claimed to fly engines years before the Wrights. And yet, we don't talk about them. Flight didn't start in one moment, it flickered for centuries. And somewhere along the way, we just stopped remembering. Because history isn't just what happened, it's what we choose to write down.